seconds. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Rebecca Sweetman and I am the director of the British School at Athens. Um, it's a huge pleasure to welcome you here, uh, well, here online to this Upper House Seminar. It's online because uh, Yerashimos was in the absolutely brilliant position of being able to get to Qatar rather unexpectedly. And we really didn't want to lose the opportunity of hearing his work. And um, we rather persuaded him that uh, it would be really um, good if we could do it online. So I'm very grateful to you, Yerashimos, for giving us your time, even though you're away, and to the audience as well for their uh, understanding too. Um, Yerasimus is currently the BSA Early Career Fellow. Now, um, it's not, I mean, to be honest with you, Early Career Fellow, yes, he is Early Career, but actually if you look at all that he's achieved already, you would never know that he was Early Career. Um, his youthful looks as well. I mean, it's ridiculous. He's professor, wait, wait for it, hold on to yourselves. He's professor of international relations at the University of Glasgow. There, he's also the chair of the ethnicity, nationalism and uh, migration studies group. He's the editor of migration studies, which is a fabulous journal. And all this means that it's not going to be very surprising to you that his research is focused on migration, diplomacy, and foreign policy. His work has taken him in terms of focus to the global South, Middle East, North Africa, and of course, the Eastern Mediterranean. He is a prolific publisher. Uh, he's published, for example, two monographs and numerous articles as well. And recently, he's won a prestigious ERC starting grant for his project on migration diplomacy. Um, we're incredibly fortunate that you are our early career fellow this year, and we're really looking forward to seeing lots more of you. There's a lot of overlap between some of the work that we do here at the BSA in terms of migration and the, and the work that you do as well. So um, I'm looking forward to creating some really interesting programs in the future with your, with your work. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to uh, Yerasimos, please. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for, for, uh, for hosting me at the BSA this year. And thank you for this very kind introduction. Um, I, I hope I, I live up to it for the next 45 minutes as I, uh, I talk about a, a project that is, that is very uh, dear to my, uh, my heart that has to do with uh, an examination of, of migration and politics in the Greek-Turkish context. Uh, Turkey is one of the countries that I study for my ERC grant on, on migration diplomacy. Uh, so this is a, a paper that's evolving slowly out of that. Uh, so it's still very much a work in progress. I um, I cannot see you at the moment, and I do apologize. I wish we could do this face to face, uh, and I hope we get a chance to 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 meet uh, face to face in the next semester in Athens. Uh, but I want to stress that I'm keen to receive feedback. Anything that you see uh, that you enjoy, or that you question, or that you're not convinced by, please raise it at the Q and A. Uh, as I, I really I really value these uh, kinds of interactions. Uh, so without further ado, this paper is called uh, Greek-Turkish Relations and Migration Power Politics in the Mediterranean. Uh, so for all of you that might have to think about migration and, and Greek-Turkish relations, uh, many of you that might be more historically minded might uh, travel back to 1923 uh, and the population exchange between the two countries or 1950s, 1960s, and the, the troubling events of the Greek community of Istanbul at the time. Those of you that are more uh, minded about contemporary events and contemporary politics might think of 2015 and 2016, uh, the European refugee crisis, and the fact that both countries, uh, through no fault of their own, were catapulted in the world stage in terms of managing this, this humanitarian um, exodus of asylum seekers, migrants, refugees, uh, fleeing Syria, but also other countries in the aftermath of the, the Arab uprisings. Uh, what I'll talk to you for the next uh, 40, 40, 45 minutes or so is uh, one episode that doesn't get a lot of uh, attention, but I would argue is, is crucial in understanding how migration features in the two countries' politics. Uh, and this is where the picture is taken from. This is February 2020, 
uh, a few weeks or days even before the outbreak of the pandemic, before COVID-19 hit the news. Uh, this is an event that took place in the uh, on the land border between Greece and Turkey, alongside the Evros River or the Pasarkule crossing from the Turkish side. Uh, as uh, a few thousand people, although, although the numbers are disputed, and we'll talk about this in just a bit, uh, but a number of, of people were encouraged to make their way to the land border between Greece and Turkey uh, at that precise uh, point where this photograph was taken uh, and try to cross over into Europe. Uh, Greece responded quite forcibly, uh, creating uh, a police and military barrier uh, that essentially securitized the border in a way that we haven't seen before and prevented essentially uh, an exodus of, of people uh, into Europe. That essentially in a nutshell is the story that I'm going to, to be focusing on. Uh, although I think it's much more complex than it uh, initially seems. And I'll be using it for two reasons. Firstly, as an IR person myself, an international relations scholar, I will use it in an effort to push the theory a bit forward. So I will talk briefly about, uh, briefly, I promise, uh, about theoretical perspectives on this and what we can learn from Greece, from a Greece-Turkey uh, comparison. Uh, but also, I will try to use what happened in February and March 2020 between the two countries uh, to show that these refugee crises, quote unquote, can be distinctly political. Uh, so uh, if you bear with me, I hope by the end of these 43 minutes or so now, I will convince you that what happened at the border uh, on those fateful weeks in February and March 2020 had really nothing to do with refugees themselves. It had to do with a lot of other things, but refugees were really not at the heart of Greek politics or Turkish politics vis-a-vis -vis what was happening on the border. Uh, and I'll tell you what I mean in just a second. Uh, so how will we structure this? So a quick slide on what's about to follow. Uh, firstly, I will uh, delve briefly on the relevant literature. Uh, from the social sciences perspective, but particularly in my field, which is political science and international relations, talk a bit about um, how migration, diplomacy, conflict features, uh, all this feature in our understanding of international relations or not, actually. Before delving a bit more deeply into the concept of migration diplomacy, uh, which we're trying to develop currently, and this is uh, this paper is very much an exercise in extending its reach and trying to make it a bit more nuanced than it might be right now, uh, by drawing on a number of scholars, including uh, Robert Putnam. Uh, Robert Putnam, uh, one of the famous American uh, political scientists who about 30 years ago now, put forth the, the famous concept of two-level games. Uh, and I'll talk about it in just a moment. Most of my, my talk, however, and I sympathize with the, the, the large portion of the audience that is probably not political scientist, will be focused on the border crisis in 2020 and looking at it from three perspectives. Uh, from the domestic perspective, in terms of Greek domestic politics and Turkish domestic politics, from a bilateral dimension, in terms of how this event uh, featured or uh, perhaps augmented tensions that were already existing on the bilateral relationship between the two countries, but also very importantly on the global or international dimension. So I will demonstrate to you that the international, uh, that, that, that countries and states and powers outside Greece and Turkey had a lot to do with what was happening at the time. And this also helps us understand perhaps how we can use the concept of migration diplomacy to understand something more about the world as it is. And I'll conclude briefly with a few notes about whether what happened in, in 2020 between Greece and Turkey has been replicated in other parts of the European Union and what we can learn from it as, as critical students of, of politics uh, today. So uh, very briefly on, on a literature review, uh, so essentially, uh, when we look at uh, how migration has featured in political science uh, and international relations, one of the most striking things that one immediately notices is that this is not really talked about. So for a number of decades, and in fact, for most of the 20th century, migration, refugees, diasporas, 
uh, internally displaced persons were not really the focus of international relations. Uh, if you delve a bit more deeply into the debates that were going on at the time, uh, it, it becomes fairly obvious that migration was relegated to a low politics issue. Uh, so big thinkers in international relations would concern themselves with uh, alliances, with war, with peace, all of these high politics issues. For them, migration was relegated to something that would be managed across different governmental departments, NGOs, something that does not really fit in terms of an agenda that has to do with IR, with global politics. So for a number of reasons, thus, we are um, in this field, as we're working through trying to understand the, the politics of migration, we're playing catch up. Uh, so this is still very much a, a field that is growing uh, rapidly. Even when over the last 20, 30 years, uh, migration uh, picked up pace. So you'll see professors of migration, you'll see departments, you'll see funding from the European Union, from other international bodies uh, that have to do with migration. Uh, this, I would argue, is a kind of a one step forward, two steps back kind of situation in which, yes, migration does finally become part of a Western scholarship's agenda and policymaking agenda. But the problem is, uh, again, if you if you take a critical look at it, that it is approached in a deeply European or some would argue uh, Eurocentric manner. So we do from the 90s onwards start caring about migration in Greece as well as elsewhere, but we tend to do it in terms of how, how it affects us, us in Greece, us in Europe, or I would argue us in the West. So topics that are picked up are about immigration, about security, about borders, about citizenship, about about nationality, in terms of how we and our politics can sort of uh, operate or have been changed by this phenomenon of people coming in. The problem here is that this marginalizes and silences a number of important processes that take, pl that take place outside the European context. Um, I've, I've written uh, a number of times that migration that takes place outside the West, so from the global South to other parts of the global South, think for instance, uh, people from South Asia or Southeast Asia going to Hong Kong, going to the Gulf and so on and so forth. These types of movements are significantly larger in terms of population sizes than those of people coming to Europe or North America. And yet the scholarship from the 1990s onwards did not really pay too much attention at things like temporary migration, uh, diaspora politics, um, emigration, so the politics of labor emigration, remittances. All of this phenomena and all of this terminology is kind of sidelined. So even though there is a bit of progress in, in our uh, discipline, there was still a bit of um, way to go. Uh, and uh, finally, one critique I would uh, raise that has to do with how we treat the, the, the world of migration and the politics of migration today has to do with our intent, uh, perhaps, uh, to, to split things up, to sort of put things in neat boxes that separate labor migration and forced migration. So uh, labor migration means, of course, economic migrants, people leaving a country to pursue employment abroad. Forced migration means asylum seekers, refugees, people that were forced to move uh, from their country into another country. And this is, this is of course, a dichotomy that has been replicated in academia, in the news, in the media, in policy circles. And yet, what's interesting here is that if you, if you look a bit more closely, you see that most countries of the world lack the resources to make the differentiation between these two groups, uh, these two uh, types of, of movement. Uh, essentially, the global South, as we've come to call the, the non-Western world, lacks any distinction between the two. Uh, many of the states outside the West are not signatories to the refugee convention that obliges them legally to recognize a person as a refugee. All of these people tend to be in the margins or in the, um, in the shadows between these two behemoths of, of concepts, essentially. And this is something we need to keep in mind that we need to step away from sort of 
artificially dichotomizing between who is a migrant and who is a refugee, because in reality, this is quite blurred. So where do I do where do um, I come in? Well, my my research on this and, and Rebecca was was very, very kind to identify a couple of things that have kept me uh, busy. Uh, my, my way forward is to look at uh, classical work in international relations and political science. Remember, we're playing catch up, right, in terms of migration and see whether and how these large, um, important, uh, crucial concepts may be applied to the field of migration. One of these is interdependence. So interdependence is a political economy concept that argues that, well, migration creates uh, reciprocal political economy effects in the countries of origin and in the countries of, of destination. Uh, so that's one way forward that we can talk about it in the Q&A if you want, in terms of how to bring IR into the field of, of migration. Uh, this, this lecture focuses on the concept of, of migration diplomacy as uh, I've developed it in, in um, cooperation also with a, with a wonderful colleague at, at the University of London. And we argue uh, that it's time to bring diplomacy into the field of migration, that there is something really um, crucial that's not been studied uh, in terms of how foreign policy and migration interact. How do they interact? Well, we define migration diplomacy as the strategic use of migration in order to obtain other aims as well as the use of diplomacy to achieve goals related to migration. What this means in practice is that migration may be um, both the dependent and the independent variable. Or for those of you that are not uh, kind of positivistically uh, minded, migration can affect foreign policy, but foreign policy can also affect migration. So this is how we, we conceptualize this uh, going forward. Uh, one example for this would be, for instance, um, uh, the, the events that were taking place in terms of uh, Poland and Belarus uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when uh, Lukashenko, the, Belaru the Belarusian leader, was dissatisfied in terms of EU foreign policy, that he tried to create a mini refugee crisis on the border with Poland, if you remember. This uh, is a case of foreign policy creating migration flows that didn't exist there before. This was not a refugee crisis to be banished. This was something that was created artificially because of existing foreign policy grievances. The opposite would be essentially what's happening currently with Ukraine, for instance. So the war between Russia and Ukraine has created refugee flows that need to be managed. And diplomacy plays a role in this. So existing refugee flows leading to effects in terms of my uh, in terms of diplomatic and foreign policy um initiatives so for us migration diplomacy can explain both both what lukashenko was trying to do but also uh, the ukrainian refugee crisis we're currently undergoing sounds okay right it sounds sounds plausible hopefully so far well uh, yes and and no and this is where this paper comes in um we we have had uh this concept has proven popular. Uh, it, it has essentially appeared at the time in the aftermath of the EU-Turkey statement or the EU-Turkey deal uh, of 2016, of March 2016. We published this in 2019. And scholars were trying to make sense essentially of how migration is um, affected by and affects power politics. So it gained quite a bit of traction. Uh, it, it, it features in work in international relations, security, area studies, and yet there are still a couple of problems with it. One is that by default, migration diplomacy looks at the world as a world of states. Uh, and what does this mean? Well, it looks at the, um, at the state as a unitary actor in terms of a single state having a single national interest that it pursues to the end. So in other words, we would see it in the media, Greece wants this, Turkey wants this, uh, Lukashenko wants this. And this uh, approach is quite useful, at least as a starting point. But the more you delve into it, you more you real, the more you realize that these states are not exactly unitary actors. There's numerous actors within that uh, state that vie for attention. There is the opposition parties. There is the military. There's NGOs. Uh, 
There's the European Union that somehow is not a state but still affects state behavior. So how do we deal with this, right? And at the same time, uh, something that is perhaps a bit more academic, it tends to reify uh, a divide between the global north and global south. One of the things that we see in, in work that uses the term migration diplomacy is that it's usually pitted in this kind of us versus them dichotomy. So Turkey uh, doing something versus Greece, Libya versus Italy, Lukashenko versus Poland. So it, it reifies this divide between perhaps an aggressor uh, and a target. This kind of um, dichotomization, again, that I would argue simplifies things a bit too much. Uh, and I'll talk about this in just a second when it comes to Turkey. So very briefly, uh, speeding through the theoretical perspective, uh, what I was just talking about in terms of the states having states having a single unitary um, interest and being unitary actors is a key tenet of neorealism in IR. And this is uh, a critique that I raise in terms of migration diplomacy, not yet having room to understand domestic or international factors. It focuses squarely on governments. And what I'm trying to do here is uh, essentially, as I said at the beginning, draw on um, Professor Patnam's work uh, that, that published something, gosh, I think that's that's quite a long time ago, uh, on the logic of two-level games. What Patnam said back in 1988 is that international negotiations between two governments also always take into account the domestic audiences. So there's only so much a government can do when it negotiates with another government before going back to the electorate, before going back to its domestic political context and selling that deal, essentially. So what he essentially paved the way for, Robert Putnam, is to look at diplomacy as a two-level game, one that takes place between governments and one that takes place between each government and the domestic politics sphere. Uh, so that's something I am building on and I'll I'll show you how it works in the, uh, the Greek-Turkish case. And the second has to do with the EU. Uh, the European Union has this um, extremely and increasingly potent actor when it comes to migration and migration politics that we have yet to conceptualize. The EU comes in, and it comes in strongly in the, e the Greek-Turkish case, and I'll explain in just a second, as both a financial actor, as this um, actor that, that gives money to security, borders, policing, uh, fingerprinting, all these kinds of uh, industries, but also beyond financial as a normative actor. Normative actor meaning essentially uh, the EU standing for a set number of human rights, a set number of values, projecting itself as this um, power that is uh, Western, liberal, good, pro-human rights, all these kinds of normative underpinnings. And somehow we need to, to, to make sense of this. So how do we make sense of this? I'll skip this because I'm talking to an audience that probably knows where Greece is, uh, but pardon that, uh, that picture. Here's a second picture that is uh, crucial in terms of understanding perhaps the, the um, interrelated history of these two countries. Uh, this is 1923. Of course, this is Azmirna, and this is uh, essentially the, 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 one of the foundational moments of the, the modern Turkish state, uh, where essentially we start a long history of common ties in terms of the management of mobility, manage, the management of mobility between the two countries. This was negotiated, this is the Treaty of Lausanne, 1923, where essentially the entire Greek population, uh, with some exceptions, out of Turkey or what was the um, Ottoman Empire, moves into uh, Greece, and the Muslim population of Greece is then relocated into Turkey. This, this amazing uh, process that sets the stage for a number of other attempts at using uh, this interplay between migration diplomacy and, and bilateral politics. Um, the Treaty of Lausanne is more than just the exchange of populations. I'm, I'm not a historian, so I'll, I'll skip through this, And but suffice it to say that uh, there is an effort to settle the status of, of the Greek population in Imbros and Tenedos. A few years later, 
uh, when Venizelos comes back to power in 1930, a treaty of friendship is signed where again migration is at the heart in terms of trying to regulate the status of property claims uh, of the repatriated communities out of 1923 that amazingly seven years later were still struggling to secure their property rights. Uh, fast forward, of course, Cyprus comes in uh, to the, the, the into play in terms of the two states migration diplomacy with Britain in this as guaranteeing powers in, in Cyprus. And a few years later, also a number of issues that emerge in terms of the Greek population of Istanbul, the Muslim population in Western Thrace, and so on and so forth. I don't want to, 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 to waste too much time on this on this history, but we can easily, I'm happily talk about this in, in the Q&A. Fast forward perhaps to the, to the 2010s, with, with both countries essentially being held in this European refugee crisis uh, and having to somehow find a way to uh, manage it yet again. So again, we see the two countries uh, trying to work something out in uh, what ev ev evolved into the, the EU-Turkey deal of, of March 2016. A lot has been written about this deal, so I, I don't want to, to talk about it now. It will come into the analysis. But I want to fast forward to uh, the event of the talk, which is February 2020. And what happens in February 2020 is that almost overnight, uh, essentially in a few hours time, uh, a number of asylum seekers uh, with an estimated number of 10,000 plus uh, are organized uh, and encouraged to make their way across a number of Turkish towns towards uh, Pazarkule, the border pro the border crossing between Greece and Turkey at the Evros um, River. So that's where we are. Uh, and this is where the, the analysis comes in. And we try to understand it, essentially, as political scientists, as migration diplomacy students, on these three perspectives, the domestic, the regional, or bilateral, and the international. And perhaps we can start with the domestic in trying to understand, well, is there anything to be said about this crisis, this mini crisis on the border, paving the way for political gains on either side? And this, this is based on data analysis, both in Greece and in Turkey, and a number of, of interviews that I can talk about if, if you want. Uh, but let's talk about Turkey first. For Turkey, what's, what's most interesting, perhaps, is the timing of this. This happens in 20. Uh, in the afternoon of the 27th of February, uh, 2020, only a few hours after the news breaks that 33 Turkish soldiers were killed in Idlib. Uh, this is in the context of the, the Syrian civil war. Of course, Turkey is heavily involved in this at the time and suffers, the news breaks that it suffers the biggest loss of life in the Turkish army in terms of foreign soil operations since 1974, since the Cyprus invasion of 1974. This is a big deal for Turkish domestic politics. This is a big deal for uh, President Erdogan as well. So one of the things that strikes me here is, well, we can't really be sure in terms of non-democratic politics, we can never go up to somebody and ask them, well, why were you doing what you were doing? But we can use our um, the evidence around each event to make sense of it, to process trace it, to use the, the political science um, uh, language. So the timing of this is quite interesting. Uh, the morning of the 27th, news breaks about this loss of life. By the early afternoon, uh, people are already uh, making their way to the border. So a cynically minded observer would argue that this is one attempt at perhaps distracting public opinion. Uh, and this is something that has been raised in critical Turkish media, that this was quite cynically something that President Erdogan does in order to distract attention from the loss of life uh, in the context of the Syrian civil war. What's also something interesting in terms of the, in terms of the domestic aspect of this is that the crisis plays neatly uh, against the media narratives across Turkey at the time that would be increasingly accusing Syrian refugees of enjoying life. There is a growing xenophobia across Turkey at the time, this is 2020, that is sharply different from the initial welcoming uh, that, that, Turkey, uh, in, uh, that Turkey offers to, to Syrian refugees. By 2020, 
things are a bit different. There is a narrative that, well, these Syrian refugees are here. Uh, they're not doing much. They're having the time of their life. Meanwhile, Turkish soldiers are being killed for them in Syria. Something needs to happen. And the fact that this refugee crisis appears at this moment is very interesting in terms of how it serves to perhaps undercut this media narrative. What's interesting as well is if you look at electoral politics in Turkey, one of the interesting things uh, that, that emerges is that opposition to Syrian refugees uh, is most visible in the south. Of course, that would make sense because that's closer to Syria. It's heavily affected uh, by Syrian refugees seeking shelter in southern Turkey. What's interesting, though, politically, is that the southern part of Turkey is also the electoral stronghold of the AKP party of President Erdogan. So Urfa, Gaziantep, these are towns that Erdogan cannot afford to lose uh, in the next elections. And interestingly, this again plays into a narrative that this crisis was manufactured to serve domestic political agendas. Only a year before, in fact, in 2019, Turkey had uh, mayoral elections. Uh, and one of the surprises is that AKP, the party of, of President Erdogan, loses Istanbul. Of course, that was a, a shattering defeat. One of the things that was uh, most interesting for us scholars of migration is that the winner of the Istanbul mayoral elections, Imamoglu, actually was able to tap on local discontent against Syrian refugees. So this is in the back of Erdogan's mind, quite quite surely. Um, so hopefully I'm, I'm convincing you at least a bit that the timing of this crisis from the Turkish perspective uh, and the way it plays out on the border has something to do with domestic politics in Turkey. This is not something that emerges by itself, but it serves uh, domestic political interests of the ruling party. Can the same be said about Greece? Uh, remember, one of the points of this analysis is to break down this kind of dichotomy between good and bad, and um, the, evil pine, the, the, the evil center of refugees and the good receiver of refugees. So can we say that, that Greece, in a way, also aimed to somehow use whatever was happening at the border for, a political, uh, for political reasons? And I would argue that it could. Remember, this is 2020. We just had elections, national elections. A new democracy uh, comes in to replace uh, the Syriza party uh, that had a very specific uh, and many would say overly liberal attitude towards uh, asylum seekers during its uh, its rule. New democracy and, um, uh, and, and Prime Minister Mitsotakis comes in seeking to essentially use this crisis as a way of energizing their base, I argue. Uh, this is a political party that was, in fact, elected on a platform to combat irregular migration uh, and promised to securitize the border with Turkey. So this comes at a very opportune time uh, for the, the Greek government, I would argue, uh, not only in terms of its own supporters, because New Democracy is able to find some grounds in order to rally its supporters on this, but it's also able to use this crisis to create a stark contrast with Syriza, uh, a party that would have handled this crisis quite differently. Uh, and I'm, this is not me taking sides, but we could perhaps uh, expect a more humanitarian approach from, from the, the Syriza uh, party, particularly given its background in terms of open border policies. But we can, I would argue in this paper, and I'm happy to hear what you think, that there is something to be said about a center-right uh, party in government using a, a refugee crisis on the border in terms of uh, getting support. This rally around the flag effect that we say, that we use in, in political science. And if anybody was, was paying attention at the time uh, of February 2020, these, these kinds of images would not really strike you as peculiar. Uh, the crisis was securitized from the Greek perspective from the very beginning. Uh, the prime minister wearing um, uh, specifically uh, colored attire would make his way to the border almost immediately. He would uh, greet uh, military officials. He would bring the police in. This was an, a, an effort to highly and visibly securitize this border. 
even though many would argue uh, that there weren't that many people trying to cross, but that's a different conversation I'll get to in just a second. Uh, but for us, critical readers of politics and critical um, thinkers in terms of what this discourse does, is that it does portray the image of a strong leader that aims to highlight issues of security rather than humanitarianism, which plays into the political agenda of the ruling party at the time. So that's for the domestic part. What about the regional or the bilateral aspect? Is, is there anything to say about whether the 2020 crisis was affected by the relationship between Greece and Turkey at the time? And as a researcher myself, I, I found that to be quite strikingly uh, obvious, if for no other reason, because it was really difficult to identify objective coverage and objective narratives of what was happening at the border during the time. Uh, so I resorted to the paper using Deutsche Welle, the, the, the German media outlet that was at the border covering this. And its, uh, its coverage identified how a humanitarian catastrophe was being used for the benefit of the Greek and Turkish governments as a Greek-Turkish propaganda battle. What, what does that mean, essentially? So if you were to look at statements being made by politicians at the time, if you were trying to find out what was being covered in the press, uh, the Greek side of this would be um, could be rightly described as uh, fairly, uh, fairly intense and, and almost xenophobic. So the Greek Speaker of Parliament at the time uh, would actually accuse Turkey of being a proper migrant smuggler. Uh, a number of far-right sources would accuse Erdogan of planning to Islamicize Greece, uh, that this is an invasion, uh, that this is another 1821, this is a second war of independence. All these kinds of, of rhetoric that affected uh, the coverage of this event, but also demonstrate how much this this mini uh, this mini uh, crisis plays into uh, fears that go much deeper. I think that what was happening in twenty twenty. Interestingly, the the sacrificial lambs here were the hard facts and the objective facts in terms of migration diplomacy. So anytime somebody in the Greek media would try to highlight um, a supposed human rights violations by Greek uh, police or military, they would be dismissed as fake news. Um, Greek politicians would actually uh, caution social media users to not share this type of information because they don't want to further Turkish propaganda. So this is this very interesting, very kind of polarizing narrative that perhaps is best exemplified by um, statistical <laughs> manipulation. Uh, so on, on the 1st of March, a few days after this crisis had started, the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs set out a statement that said that it had the Greek authorities had prevented 10,000 asylum seekers from entering Greece. So about 10,000 people tried to cross the border, only 73 of them were able to do this. This is official Greek sources from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Same day, the Turkish Ministry of Interior puts out a statement that says that, well, 117,677 migrants had already crossed into Greece. This astounding difference in terms of, of numbers that makes it really hard to essentially estimate the truth. Uh, and as a, as a scholar of Middle East politics, as, as Rebecca said at the beginning, I'm quite used to this kind of um, data manipulation when it comes to uh, the Syrian refugee crisis, for instance, we see it quite a lot in countries like Lebanon, Jordan. I was quite surprised that in, in 2020, uh, we were unable to estimate the exact number of people that had tried to cross a land border in a very, very visible manner. So you can see that the, the numbers are, are striking. I go into this into the project quite a lot. By the 5th of March, uh, the Turkish uh, official sources said that, well, about 135,000 people had crossed the border into Greece. So 135,000 uh, had made their way into Greek territory. If you look at Greek sources, they say that only 220 of them made it over. So this astounding difference in terms of facts that I argue um, demonstrates the extent to which these, these crises, be it security, military, refugee, whatever, 
play into this broader distrust and this long history of troubled bilateral uh, politics. Um, finally, in all of this, I wanted to bring the third level. So we talked about the domestic politics. We talked about the bilateral. I wanted to briefly talk a bit about the European level or the international politics of this. And this is something that typically doesn't get uh, enough attention. And, and perhaps many of you might argue, well, why, why is the European Union even relevant in a story that's so distinctly uh, bilateral, so distinctly Turkish or so distinctly Greek? Well, I would argue that it is a crisis in which the European Union had a, a massive role to play uh, for a number of reasons. So for Greece, one of the things that happens is that uh, by the 3rd of March, uh, the new democracy government uh, invites the three top leaders of the European Union. So Ursula von der Leyen, Charles Michel, David Sassoli, they're all pictured here. They all fly into Evros. So they take the military helicopter over together with uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis to essentially uh, pa patrol what's going on, to, to see what's going on. Uh, and the new democracy government uses this as a way, arguably, to, to, to establish its pro-European Union credentials. Uh, it would be, I think, quite easy to, to compare this to the troubled relationship between Syriza and the European Union. This is still the time of the bailout negotiations. This is still the time where um, uh, Syriza and its its far right counterpart would go into fights with Angela Merkel and Brussels and all of this. New democracy comes in and is able to use this refugee crisis at the border in order to establish the country's pro EU credentials. Not only do we have EU officials now on Greek territory during this crisis, we also have this statement repeated over and over that the Greek external border is the European border. So you see how essentially Europe does play a significant role here, if if only in a way to establish normatively uh, the pro-EU credentials of, of the ruling uh, party in government. But of course, the EU is also a, a significant financial actor, as I said at the beginning. And this is a story of what I call refugee rent seeking, essentially using refugees as an instrument of um, gaining uh, material support. And indeed, uh, Greece, out of this uh, few weeks of um, pain and suffering at the, the land border, secures about 700 million euros in financial assistance by the EU. So it's interesting here that this is not merely rhetorical, this is not merely identity politics, but it has a huge financial component too. But this is not to say that Turkey doesn't also look up to the European Union, albeit in, in different ways. So for Erdogan, many we, we, we cannot know for sure, of course, right? This is all something that we put together using piecemeal information and evidence. So that's unfortunately what we're, we're tasked with. Uh, I would argue that uh, one distinct hope for the uh, Turkish government is that this crisis would finally convince the EU and Brussels to support Erdogan's proposal for a safe zone uh, in northeast Syria. So this is something I think that's on the back of Erdogan's mind. This is something that I would I would expect he's hoping to get out of this. At the same time, what's interesting is that Erdogan goes on uh, a number of of talks and speeches and 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 and, and uh, public events at the time, and he's able to essentially use the EU as a normative actor but in the opposite way that the Greeks did. So the EU is not a supporter of uh, of good. They're not here to help. They're not here to do something that is um, ethically uh, and morally sound. They're here as, a, as, a, as evidence of hypocrisy. So for Erdogan, he repeats over and over again, look at these Europeans, right? They talk about human rights and democracy and the rule of law, and they use rubber bullets against these poor people that are trying to get to Europe, right? So he uses the crisis and upgrades it to the European Union level as a way of essentially establishing, highlighting European hypocrisy. And on a second level, perhaps also setting himself apart as the leader, as this non-European uh, leader that has uh, been able to um, essentially uh, 
bring this to the forefront, uh, highlight this hypocrisy. I'm almost done, just a, a last slide on the conclusions of all of this uh, and uh, the ways of, of looking forward. So I've been talking, gosh, yes, 40, 40 minutes or so. Hopefully I've managed to at least partially convince you that what happened in, in the border between Greece and Turkey in 2020 was political. Um, as you can see, the, the narrative across three levels, the domestic, the bilateral, and the European level, has very little to do with refugees themselves. There's very little talk about humanitarianism. There's very little talk about human rights. There's very little attempt to understand what's happening, who these people are, where they're coming from, and all this. This comes so shortly, perhaps, after what happened in 2015 and 2016, so as the two sides are still in this battle mode and are ready to essentially move into their, their defense positions. Um, whatever they are, hopefully you agree with me that this has very little to do with either Greece or Turkey um, using migration diplomacy to defend the rights of asylum seekers, of these vulnerable uh, individuals. What I argue theoretically is that what we see in this small case, in these few weeks on the Greek-Turkish border, debunks the assumption of a unitary state, a unitary migration state. Greece does not have a single national interest. Arguably, Turkey doesn't have either, because they are constantly going back to their bases. They're thinking about how to use whatever's happening in order to shore up domestic political support. And they're also projecting this on the European Union level according to their own priorities. What I'm hoping to do, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what you what you think about this, is that uh, is to perhaps use this 2020 tale uh, about questioning this normative binary that we construct between a, a good, liberal, wealthy Western state uh, that is attacked and a bad, illiberal, poor, or cash-strapped non-Western state. What we see at the very least is that both Greece and Turkey operate in a rather cynical fashion. Uh, so whereas one country, of course, has the the, the brunt of the grant of the uh, the brunt of the blame, sorry, in, in order in terms of who actually instigates this, I think it's the in terms of making judgments and establishing who holds the 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 who try to benefit most perhaps from this is something that is a, is a longer discussion. At the very least, what we can perhaps establish is that the European Union is, is firmly embedded in migration diplomacy in the periphery. So for Greece, it becomes this global financial actor that is to be co-opted, right? We need to helicopter them in, we need to show them what's happening in order to get support. Rhetorical, but also material support. For Turkey, we need to use uh, the European Union as a normative actor for our attack against hypocritical, hypocritical Western um, liberal elites, essentially that do not hesitate to use real politique when it doesn't suit them. So that's broadly where I am. Uh, the, the last point, and I'm going to end with this, is whether uh, 2020 was an exception uh, or whether it is increasingly part of the rule in terms of migration and migration diplomacy. What's striking is that over the last few years, what happened in 2015, 2016, and what happened in 2020 in the um, in the Greek-Turkish cases is being replicated elsewhere. So I talked briefly about 2021, 2022, in terms of Belarus and the European Union and the border crisis there. At the same time, uh, in 2021, once relations between Morocco and Spain deteriorated, Morocco opened up the border and started letting migrants and asylum seekers into Spain. Similar situations have been identified in Libya, um, in Tunisia to some extent. So one of the things that, that we can think about is whether what we're experiencing in the Greek-Turkish case in 2020 is not the, the past, but is, is part of the present and the future of this kind of coercive migration diplomacy. Right In the aftermath of the EU-Turkey deal of 2016, we've reached a slippery slope in which migrants, refugees, asylum seekers are, are becoming increasingly commodified, instrumentalized, and the, the language of human rights goes away and is, is replaced by this kind of realpolitik, this emphasis on um, 
how refugees may fit into the political agendas of national and uh, supranational uh, elites. And gosh, with this with this dark note, I'm going to to stop here, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to to any questions. And thank you for your attention uh, so far. Thank you so much. That was uh, fabulous. Really. Today I share my screen. Do uh, do do. Yeah yeah. We'd love to see more of your face. <laughs> uh, thank you very very much, Yadashima. That was amazing. And there's so many striking elements of your talk. Scary elements of your talk. Um, one of the things you just talked about now, actually, at the very end, which I was most struck by, is that I don't know if you remember, this was a period about six or seven years ago where we were all, the, the language of human rights was very much in under the microscope with things like talking about floods and swarms of refugees. And to think now that it's even gone beyond that and it's being monetized, it was shocking to think that, you know, there's that there's, there's a financial potentially financial gain from 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 this migration crisis um uh, it, it's quite shocking i have lots of questions um but i would like to um uh, open up the floor if you have questions um everybody please feel free to type them into the q and a um I, I, I that's the only way you can um ask them uh, i know that uh yorgos has a question here um he says uh if you have oh if you have time no he, that's not what he said to me he said that to me <laughs> he said you talked uh, about your that your conclusions are based on data analysis can you please tell us what kind of data this is is it for example statistics such as the examples you mentioned about numbers of migrant or migrants trying to cross the borders yes so thanks thanks your yes this is in the paper and i'm, I'm happy to share it if if it sounds intriguing. So this is this is based on on media analysis in Greek and Turkish newspapers primarily. This is an event. Bear in mind that it was highly visible. So this is not we're not really looking for something that was buried in the papers. Both the Greek media and the Turkish media uh, were were quite abuzz with this. Uh, so it was very e easy to identify uh, Greek sources and Turkish media sources and use discourse analysis. And then I tried as best as possible to triangulate these findings uh, with statistical information. Uh, but you saw my note that this is not really possible and interviews uh, in Athens and in, in Istanbul uh, primarily. So that 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 is my my way around it with the caveat that um, data is is lacking both so both both sides. That's why I had to resort to to German media at some point, because both sources, both sides took a heavily uh, polarized view I found of the situation and it was really difficult to determine what was happening at the time. Thank you. Um, there's a question from David Blackman, former director of the BSA. He says, a fascinating presenta presentation. Did President Erdogan's visit to Athens this week deal with any of these questions? What a fantastic, that's a fantastic question. He did not. Uh, one of the things that's that makes most, that that's super interesting about this and um, and, and perhaps paves uh, perhaps supports the the point that this wasn't really about the, the the plight of of asylum seekers is that this disappears almost immediately. So when news breaks about COVID, I, I think it was around the the tenth. I don't I don't remember when or, or in March twenty twenty. Uh, these these poor folks are bussed back in, into uh, cities into Istanbul and neighborhoods of Istanbul and other towns. And we never hear about this again. Uh, there is a statement by Erdogan saying we will not, uh, we will stand down, but we reserve the right to do this again. But it has not popped up again. Um, but that's an excellent question. Um, you know what? There are loads of really good questions coming in, and I will uh, do something and sacrifice my own benefit because I know I can get you uh, another time. But uh, we have a question here. Uh, I think some Michael. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Practically all of what you said is pertinent to British politics on the eve of the parliamentary debate tomorrow, Tuesday, on the safety of Rwanda asylum. Yeah, uh, I would, I would briefly, I, I would briefly say on this that one of the things that we're examining now has to do with how. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to make this even darker, I suppose, but how these policies of coercion in migration diplomacy get get diffused across world politics. 
Uh, so I was in I was doing research in Jordan with with CBRL in in Amman, uh, 2017. Uh, and one of the things that was popping up at the time in terms of Jordanian management of the refugee crisis in in uh, the, and the Syrians were was well look at Turkey, they got six billion euros by blackmailing the European Union, right? Why can't we do something similar? And that for me was really the the the, the, the warning sign that this is this is not this is not going well. We've moved into a stage after 2016 in which there's a price to be paid about these things. And once you 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 make that initial step, I think it's it's very difficult to go back to a language of human rights and and dignity and and respect for for life. It's so I I completely agree in terms of the the Rwanda connection, and I would say that it's even even broader than this, uh, to be honest. Thank you. Um, so there's a question from Panayotis Antonopoulos. Uh, he says, "Thank you, your SMA, for your very interesting discussion." I think we should take into account the vision of the migrants themselves who surely want to get to the EU. Most important, give, could you give us a profile of the trafficker and his power in the situation? Because they appear to play no role except for executors of the wishes of others. I wonder whether it's correct to relegate them so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, uh, Panayoti, that's 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 wonderful. Uh, I've been, <laughs> I, I've had this this question come up a number of times, and unfortunately, it has to do with my methodological focus as an as an IR person. And this is not by any means aiming to shed agency away from these uh, migrants themselves or for the people that are involved in these processes. So I think there is there is something to be said there. Perhaps not by IR scholars, but there is anthropologists, there are anthropologists and sociologists working on this topic that give some fascinating insights. One of the things, for instance, has to do with uh, asylum seeker preferences, right? Uh, so one question I get is, well, why don't they just go, why don't they go to Bulgaria and through Bulgaria to Romania? And they always seem to go through, uh, through Greece, uh, essentially. So, uh, and that has to do with the fact that, well, you know, they, they do have some agency. They they choose and they would rather come to, to Greece for a number of reasons than, than go to, to Bulgaria. It has to do with um, all, all the, the EU regulations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, return to the first country uh, of, of um, the, the, the first European country that they step, they step foot on. So if they end up wanting to, to, to move to Germany or Sweden, uh, or somewhere else, and they get apprehended, they would much rather return to Greece than return to Romania or Bulgaria. So there, there is a logic here, but it just doesn't fit with my my methodology here. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a bit about this. And the trafficker is something that I haven't worked on, uh, but I think it's a fascinating aspect of this. One of the things that that was evident in this in this little story is that. Um, Erdogan appears on television. He says that we'll, we'll no longer police the border. The, the border is open. Whoever wants to make it. And almost immediately across different towns, buses are organized. Uh, it, it's an operation, right? So we always think about the traffickers as these single people coming and doing dangerous things. But there's also a very interesting operation, not on the state, but the sub-state level, in terms of some kind of organization there, right? And I'm not the person to give you information on this because this is not my my training. But I think there is something to be unpacked. Uh, and there, it's definitely not not correct to to ascribe no role to them whatsoever. So I completely I completely take that point. Thank you. Um, so I am going to try and squeeze in a question of my own. And that is, um, so I was quite struck when you said that in it was kind of the 1990s when uh, there's kind of more of an academic concern about migration and borders and citizenship and things like that. And I'm wondering what, what it was that triggered it. I mean, we have in, in ancient sources, in literary sources, we have concerns about migration and citizenship and borders. You know, Demosthenes is talking about it, Cicero is talking about it. And yeah. it was definitely uh, very much aware, people were very much aware and politicizing it too. Um, so what was it in the 1990s that led to the increased attention, having not had so much attention? That's a good. That's a good question. Uh, well, it, it's it's open to interpretation. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you my opinion. You can tell me yours if you want, Rebecca, because I'm curious. From from a political science perspective, it has to do, at the end of the day, with with the end of bipolar uh, world politics, right? So the collapse of the Soviet Union essentially means 
that uh, people that were behind the Iron Curtain are now free to move. So as, as, a, as a Greek expert yourself, I mean, you, you know this. So um, an influx of um, people from Albania, ethnic Greeks coming from the former Soviet Union, all of these uh, situations that somehow need to be managed by countries that never did have a migration policy to begin with, such as Greece uh, at the time. So that's that's one that's one more kind of um, that's one explanation. The other, perhaps a bit more cynical explanation, would be that the end of the Soviet Union meant that th there there is no there is no enemy, if you want, quote unquote. To, to, to combat, right, in terms of the United States. So there is this unipolar moment, and the, what I'm thinking is Samuel Huntington. Samuel Huntington, a few years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, published one of his last books on uh, migration coming from Mexico and Latin America, painting this as the next big uh, problem for the United States. So this kind of rhetoric was picking up in the 90s in terms of, well, once the Soviet Union has disintegrated, where do we look now? And this is the more kind of cynical um, argument of needing to construct an enemy at a time of unipolar uh, presence for America, I think. I don't know what, what your take is on this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an archaeologist, but... I'm going to start looking at it now to see if that's if that if the I mean so you're there's some parallels I suppose because in in the with the collapse of the Roman Empire for example um you have a huge uh huge amount of migration and mobility but that's also partly because there's a massive environmental issue going on in the fourth century as well um and so I think there's a kind of collation of what's going on uh, but that would chime quite nicely yeah with what's going on today. Even. Um, we have another question. Uh, okay, this is from Jorgos. You have shown very nicely that migration policy tells us a lot about how migration is conceptualized. But we, i.e. not specialists, are used to looking at migration either in a context of war or in cases such as the one you mentioned about the bad displacer and the good receiver or defender. But yes. is there room to expand and include other kinds of migration not traditionally covered so much, such as intellectual migration? We have the brain drain gain in Greece. Are you also looking at other contexts, countries, governments using population movements of all sorts to push agenda? That's that's such a that's such a wonderful question. I I wish we were doing this face to face. To be honest with you, so uh, repeat, uh, Rebecca. Uh, I th I think that's a fantastic question. And yes, you're absolutely right that there is this increased tendency to securitize the question of migration and um, underplay the fact that from a political science perspective as well, and hopefully from an archaeology perspective, uh, migration preceded the state. So we tend to look at migration as challenging state borders, challenging state sovereignty, all of these things. We tend to forget that migra migrants were, were moving around much, much earlier, as Rebecca said, than the uh, the time of you know state building uh, and, and all that. So essentially that's 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 something to keep in mind. And and I I, I do work on, on other forms such as diaspora groups and the and the politics of diaspora communities. So uh, Greeks abroad, Indians abroad, and how they mobilize in order uh, to 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 to, to, to um, support change either in their host countries or their, their sending countries. Uh, but I would say that also, if I may sort of uh, like speak for thirty more seconds on this, it's that. A shift in how we view refugees and migration is the answer I always thought to the, the, the to coercive migration diplomacy. So if we stop looking at refugees as kind of um, evil or people that are come that have come here to destroy our national identity and to to steal our jobs or whatnot, and we can because there is academic work that highlights how um, forcibly displaced people and economic migrants actually benefit states uh, look at how Germany responded to this but that's that's a different question once we we shift our approach a bit then we immediately undercut the argument about using refugees in order to coerce uh, states so I think that would be that would be my my short answer to this super thank you um 
David has uh, David Blackman has um, asked if we have any information on the nationality of the refugees at the Parzakula Gate. We do. We do, and that's a, that's that. I, I can only squeeze that ma that much into forty minutes, so I apologize for that. But we we definitely do. And the interesting thing here is that this was framed as a Syrian refugee kind of um, crisis, mini crisis, uh, repetition of how these poor Syrians need to make their way to Europe. The vast majority of these people were not Syrians, uh, so the vast majority of Syrian refugees in Turkey refused to get on a bus in two hours time and make their way to the border hoping to reach Europe. Uh, these are desperate uh, people coming from South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan. These are the nationalities that from the accounts that we have are the ones that uh, were willing essentially to, as soon as they found out that the border is open to leave everything, get on a bus and somehow end up at the border. But they're definitely they're definitely not not Syrian refugees as the the, the uh, against common wisdom perhaps in a way. Okay. Um. Is there any um uh, any more questions that could be typed in the Q and A? I think there's one just come in here. Um. And uh, are there parallels between what's happening on the ground as in the opinions of the public in Greece and Turkey, or does that go against what's going on higher up in politics and how. Does that make sense? I, mean, I, may, the question. I may have garbled it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, uh, if what's happening on the ground, as in the opinion of the public, of, of, of the of the people in Greece and Turkey, yeah. how, is, is it in parallel or does it go against what is happening higher up in politics? So I think Obviously, essentially is, is, are, are, is the government or those in power reflecting that of popular opinion. I understand. I, understand. I'm, um, I don't know who asked that, that wonderful question, but I will, um, let me take a, a substantive rain check. What we're doing right now is conducting a survey in Greece and Turkey in terms of public perceptions of migration diplomacy. So I'll give you a, a, an, an honest and accurate answer in a few months time, hopefully. But for now, I would say my, my, my um, understanding of this is that on on the Turkey side, there is fatigue. There is fatigue with the the refugee question, and we saw it during the elections that followed 2020. So there is a degree of 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 tiredness of fatigue in terms of this. Uh, so there are no massive uh, demonstrations in terms of what's happening in 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 the on the border. And I would say, given the the allegations of human rights abuses by by the Greek state as well. It's rather surprising that, that that we didn't reply that we the Greeks I mean didn't also mobilize as much as we could in terms of what was happening at the border. So I haven't looked into this uh, significantly, but I am I'm, I'm I'm thinking of how to explain it. One explanation would be that there is an alignment in terms of the government and the people, right? The other argument that I find somewhat a bit more convincing is that there's also uh, fatigue in terms of the the the, the Greek social responses to, to forced migration. Remember, we had just come out of 2015, 2016. This 2020 was was a difficult time. Uh, so I I'm a bit reticent to ascribe a lack of anti um, a, a lack of pro-refugee engagement as kind of anti-refugee dom, if that makes sense. Uh, Rebecca, because I'm also starting to not make sense, I fear. <laughs> no, 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 that did make absolute sense. And in fact, it was Tulsi uh, who asked the question, um, uh, um, the um, Levendis postdoc who's here. Um, and actually, can I just follow up uh, briefly on that? So, I mean, in some respects, how does that then fit into this concept of uh, the the oneness or of a state? So if you, if you don't have, if you have a government who's, um, you know, creating the agenda, um, and you've got migration diplomacy that is uh, explaining things, looks at the world as a set of states. Um, mm -hmm. How do you then account for? Uh, I mean, not just not just differences between uh, the people on the ground and the government, but also if there's a, an earthquake as there was in Turkey, and that changed things for so many people uh, in such a short space of time. So how do you how do you deal with those kind of fluctuations while looking at my, uh, migration diplomacy? 
Correct. The way, I mean, I'll tell you the, the way it's been done up to now. The way it's been done up to now is to look at these domestic actors, and they could be NGOs, they could be political parties, they could be all sorts of uh, actors, as uh, uh, variables that can be mobilized against the government by another state. So in this case, it would be the, the common assumption would be that, well, Turkey is um, fragmenting uh, the unitariness of the, the Greek state by essentially pitting the pro-refugee crowd against the anti-refugee crowd and creating vulnerability. So usually migration diplomacy looks at this as a vulnerability argument that I'm not I'm not sure that is relevant now. I'm, I'm not sure these cleavages are as 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 apparent nowadays as they were 10 or 15 years ago, to be honest with you. I don't know. But uh, but I'm a, I'm I'm a crypto realist in terms of my IR approach. So I I I I don't know. I I would think, but I would think they're they're less pertinent perhaps in a way um, now than they were 20 years ago. But I strive to be a crypto realist. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this has been absolutely brilliant and fascinating and. Um, you're actually just to come back to Athens and we'll we'll have you speak every week and uh, and be and be with us. It was brilliant and um huge, huge amount of um uh thanks to you for interrupting your time in Qatar. And uh we look forward to seeing you back in the BSA. And on behalf of everyone, thank you. Oh, thank you. And thank you for doing this excellent work with BSA. I look forward to to, to learning more about it in, in January and meeting people in person. Uh, so thank you for, for having me. Uh, and I thank appreciate. you, everyone. Um, we hope you have safe holidays, happy holidays, festive season, etc.